U.S. So, Council and Commissioners, I'd like to welcome you all to City Sault Ste. Marie City Council. I'd like to thank our media and broadcast partners for uh, reporting on this meeting and broadcasting it. And this is a fantastic opportunity to get together. We have an incredibly special relationship, and I think this is, demonstrates that special relationship. So I just want to point out one thing to make it a little easier on us technically. We have over here Laura. Laura, can you put up your hands? So all of your mics, <clears throat> they're not hot. The mayor's mic and my height mic are always on, but your mics aren't. When you go to speak, your mic will be on, but Laura is going to have to turn your mic on. So before you speak, if you could just kind of look at Laura and put your hand up, your mayor will give you the opportunity to speak, but just so Laura knows what mic she's turning on, that would be very helpful. So uh, Laura's right here, and just give her a look-see, and uh, she'll make sure your mic's on when it needs to be on. So welcome to our city council chambers. We're excited for tonight's meeting. I'm gonna pass the floor to Mayor Bospis. Thank you very much, Mayor, Mayor Provenzano. Um, Again, it's just a pleasure being here, uh, the City Sault Ste. Marie Commission. Um, uh, we certainly enjoy the fostering of the relationship and continue to strengthen that. And uh, whatever we can do to benefit both of our communities, uh, we certainly stand ready to help Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario uh, with that quest. Um, at this time, the um, introduction of the City Commission will be through the roll call. Um, and before we do that, I'd just like to mention that uh, Commissioner Jay Gage um, will be leaving the commission on um, the 19th of uh, June. He is accepting a position with uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow and he'll be moving to Marquette. And uh, Lindsay will be staying, as I understand it, in the city of Sault Ste. Marie for the time being. And Jay will be commuting. But uh, we certainly uh, wish to...
With that, we can open our, our side? Yeah, absolutely. Thank okay. you. Okay. I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Bospis? Here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Bauer? Here. Commissioner Gage? Here. Commissioner Gary? Here. Commissioner Lynn? Here. Commissioner Twardy? Here. Okay. Uh, please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mayor Provost. Mr. Clerk, if you could start our meeting, please. Mr. Mayor and uh, members of City Council, Mr. Mayor, I'll ask you just to introduce those members of Council who are present today. Thank you. We have Councilor Lou Turco, Councilor Frank Fada, Councilor Susan Myers, Councilor Paul Christian, Councilor Rick Nero, Councilor Matthew Shoemaker, Councilor Marchi Bruni, and Councilor Steve Butland. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, I have a motion by Councilors Bruni and Butlin resolve the, the agenda for the 2017-06-06 Twin Sioux Joint Council Commission, Commission meeting as presented be approved. All in favor? Carried. And a motion by Councilors Fat and Christian resolve that City Council now proceed into Committee of the Whole to consider the following matter referred to it for consideration, Twin Sioux Joint Council Commission meeting. All in favor? Carried. Mr. Mayor, members of uh, Council, and uh, Your Honor, Mayor Bospis, and uh, members of the City Commission, <clears throat> our next item uh, applies only to the uh, Sioux Canada side. To any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Mr. So Gordon. noted. And our first uh, presentation item is uh, Canada 150. Councillor Susan Myers will, uh, from the delegation position, give a presentation on the activities of Canada 150. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Great to be here. It's 2017 and the banner behind kind of captures uh, the Sioux Celebrates Canada 150. And early this year, um, our country of Canada called for pictures of the Canadian flag and you doing something very profound with it. So what could be more profound than a picture of City Council with the Canadian flag? So that's what you see here. We submitted that. And in January of this year at our City Council meeting, the first one of the year, we really kicked off with um, a celebration and an acknowledgement of Dr. Roberta Bonder. A number of you I know know Roberta. She's Canada's first woman in space, the world's first neurologist in space. And this happens to also be the 25th anniversary of her space flight, 1992, January 22nd to 30th. So the mayor proclaimed Dr. Roberta Bonder days in the city of Sault Ste. Marie on January 9. And uh, Dr. Bonder will be joining us for Canada Day on July 1st as uh, the honorary community ambassador uh, hosting Canada Day with um, Mayor uh, Provenzano. So obviously, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Canada is rich in Canadian history and heritage. We love to celebrate both. The Canada 150 community calendar we've developed, it's been populated well. It's on our website. So if you want to know all that's happening over here, please go to our website. You're going to see a number of posters on your desk that we're going to refer to in a few minutes that are uh, highlighting some of the special events. But uh, the calendar is a good place to go. We uh, created a post a leaf at community centers. The mayor's office has been very um, creative in coming up with some ideas. And Lisa Bell, assistant to the mayor, came up with this great idea. And our community centers are um, producing uh, red leaves. And you can you know, just go in and say, why I love Canada. And it's posted on a wall in all of our community centers. That's been very successful. In February this year, we participated in a, a Canadian national mural mosaic and it's 150 different sections to this mural from every province and territory across Canada resulting in a national mosaic train and uh, this train uh, with various uh, images from across each of these 150 communities will create um, a mosaic that's eight foot by eight foot. This was the design that we had submitted for our Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario mural and this is eight feet by eight feet. And then what happened was the artists came here who are going all across Canada guiding the communities. February 14 and 15 we had over 300 participants and each one painted a four inch by four inch tile. In this picture you'll see a real cast of characters here including our Mayor Provenzano and uh, some of our um, First Nations chiefs. 
So this is our finished mural. It's in two four foot by eight foot pieces. Together it will be mounted as one eight foot by eight foot mural. This is uh, the mayor's fantastic creative hand painted free art that he did, freehand I should say. Uh, he, he did the replica of the Susan Me logo and he simply had it on his iPhone and looked at it and painted it. So we're very proud of his artistic prowess. And this will be unveiled on Canada Day, this mosaic mural. It hasn't been revealed to the public yet and um, it will permanently be residing in uh, the foyer of City Hall. We'll get to that in a minute. So we actually had Dr. Bonder paint a tile at her home in Toronto as well. And my tile, it will never have a close up and you'll never see it on the mosaic. It was terrible, it was a disaster. But anyway, uh, moving right along. And the other thing that we were doing again out of the mayor's office, um, they came forward, uh, Lisa again, uh, with the Why I Love Canada contest. And it's actually not even really a contest, it's just a, an initiative where every school child, el every elementary school child has the option of filling in this form of Why I Love Canada and dropping it in the um, bin that you saw in the um, foyer of City Hall downstairs by reception and then once a month um, they're pulling out, the mayor's pulling out uh, one of the uh, submissions and last Monday, May 29, was our first one with our young friend here, uh, Alexander Webb. Uh, his, he came to council, he read his story about why he loved Canada, he spent some time with the mayor ahead of the meeting up in the mayor's office and the mayor presented him with a lovely uh, package of Canada 150 memorabilia, a backpack and a t-shirt and then he came to council and read his story. So that was a great initiative. And as those of you who are with the commission and submission would appreciate, the mayor and council gave me no budget for this. I'm just going to say that. So we've been coming up with things that don't cost anything. So, you know, we're on a shoestring. So if you want to know how to do something on a shoestring, trust me, I'll be able to tell you because we've done it. I had to get that plug in, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, the Mayor's Committee on Celebrate Canada 150 is planning a number of activities throughout the year and uh, really we're referring to it as a long road traveled and the kickoff for our 10 days of concentration is uh, June 21st, 12.15 here at the front steps of Civic Centre with a flag raising and literally for that next uh, 10 days in two week period there's four nationally recognized days that, that we will be highlighting. The first one is June 21st, it's National Aboriginal Day and uh, National Aboriginal Day is really important to us. Uh, it's held annually, it celebrates our Indigenous culture and the achievements made by our Aboriginal people. And Ontario, you may not know, has the largest Aboriginal population of any Canadian province. And Canada's National Aboriginal Day provides an opportunity for all Canadians to learn more about our Aboriginal neighbours. And we have a very close relationship with uh, Garden River First Nation, uh, Batchewana First Nation, and our uh, Métis Nation of Ontario, and our urban Aboriginal friends. And they'll all be participating with us. Uh, National Aboriginal Day for our Batchewana First Nation involves a celebration down at the uh, Whitefish Island area and you're, everyone's welcome to attend. And there's uh, more of this in our calendar on our website. Garden River will be also doing their own uh, that day and they'll be submitting information. So you keep going back to the calendar because it continually is updated. And then we move on to June 24th, another Canadian National um, recognition Day, it's St. Jean Baptiste Day and this celebrates uh, the Feast of the Nativity of St. Jean the Baptist um, and that's you know, a, a national holiday or excuse me, a provincial holiday in the province of Quebec and it's a time when we celebrate our French Canadian culture and heritage. Lots of music and fun and uh, a lot going on there. They have a daytime schedule, they have an evening schedule and all of their activities are taking place up at the canal area. And it's for all the family. And then we have Canadian Multiculturalism Day on June 27, and this is a day that really encourages a celebration of all of our cultural mosaic. And again, we have 200,000 immigrants a year that choose Canada, uh, drawn by our quality of life and reputation as an open, welcoming, and peaceful <coughs> society. And our Sioux Multicultural Day is celebrated with a lot of community partners, the library, our local immigration partnership, art gallery, Sioux Community Career Center, New Beginnings, and some others. And we'll certainly have a, a great time on that day. 
they have, um, again, things for all the different uh, age groups, families, and so on. And also in that afternoon on the same date of June 27, there's a seniors uh, tea going on in our senior center that's fashioned through the ages, a salute to fashions over the last 150 years. So that'll be a fun time. And then we get to our pinnacle of our event, which is Canada Day, Saturday, July 1st. And again, I mentioned Dr. Bonder, our honorary ambassador for Canada 150, will join the mayor. And this kicks off at 1 o'clock at Roberta Bonder Park. Uh, I think you're all pretty familiar with there. And that is the big white tent on our waterfront. Our, our mural mosaic will be unveiled that morning by Dr. Bonder and the mayor. But uh, there's a, a replica of it that will be on display over at the uh, opening ceremonies because it's, it's extremely heavy. And once it's mounted here in Civic Center, it will be here for a long time. There's lots of other entertainment going on that day. So uh, July 1, fireworks, as you know, and you'll be happy to know that maybe this year we'll be able to compete with our July 4th friends because we've really enhanced our fireworks. And uh, I understand that uh, we're, they're going to be quite stupendous. So we, we did have to do a sponsor a spark program. <laughs> I raise some funds. I just keep getting this dig in here, um, but it's it's been well received. So our actual schedule for that day is fairly detailed. Again, you can come to our city website. There's a whole Canada 150 linking. Uh, we have a parade of the paddles. This is going to be a lot of fun. At 10 o'clock that morning, uh, out of the Sioux Canal, there will be 150 paddlers uh, coming out, uh, heading down to the Bush Plain area where they will. Um, disembark and go over to the Ermitinger Clerk for a whole History Fest uh, day of activity. So July 1st, a lot of fun, Canada, eh? And then uh, one thing that going on after our concentrated uh, Canada 150 period is something that the Ontario government's doing. Uh, it, actually, it's Ontario 150. And this is going to be really neat. It's called Sesqui. And what Sesqui is, is it's a cinematic dome. Uh, with a free screening of a 360 degree film called Horizon. And this film is all about um, Ontario and vistas from all across uh, the province, actually all across the country. So that will be located in the northeast corner of Station Mall parking lot. So at the corner of Bay and Elgin, just sort of in that Sears corner, we'll call it for a landmark for you. So Sesqui is going to be a lot of fun. It's free. It will be here July 16 and 20. So. <coughs> Come on over and, and see us. So we have so much to celebrate as Suites and as Canadians, and we've encouraged the community to plan their own event. We have souvenir pins that are $3, but for you, they're free. They're in your package on your desk. And uh, just, again, visit our calendar if you want to come on over and join in on things. We'd really be thrilled to see you here, and it's our chance to uh, share our country celebration with you, our our best friends and our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Myers. Council Myers, there might be some questions. What we're going to do as far as questions go post-presentation is that we're going to rotate from the Commission to the City Council, and we'll always start with you for, uh, folks as deference to, uh, to you being our visitors. So your Mayor will call on you if you have questions, and he'll recognize you, and then we'll rotate over to City Council. So, Mayor? Okay. Certainly, um, just like to, on behalf of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I'd like to add our congratulations to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and certainly all of Canada for the 150th anniversary as a nation and uh, sounds like you're going to have a, a lot of uh, activities going on and we'll be celebrating our 350th anniversary next year so great um, we certainly will be talking to you about that uh, going forward but good luck with all your activities great job thank you tony and you don't look 200 years older than us at all no. <laughs> we feel like it sometimes well thank you uh, commissioner Tardy, did you have a if you're ready. Okay. Uh, just so everybody in the room knows that that's actually the same weekend that we are celebrating Engineers Weekend on yes. our side. And so I think it's going to be fantastic that we'll be able to go back and forth on both sides of the bridge and have so much to celebrate. And thank you for the beautiful fireworks show that you're going to put on that <laughs> evening for our entertainment also. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there will be fireworks on June 27th with our National Aboriginal, excuse me, June 21st, National Aboriginal Day. So don't, don't think that we've got the date wrong. They do great fireworks as well. And it's the bridge walk on that Saturday of your yeah. Engineers Day. So. Yeah, so much going on. So, and happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? We're good? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Clark? Our next item is the International Bridge Update. Peter Patanen, General Manager, International Bridge Authority, is present to provide that update. Welcome to Council and the Commission. Yes. 
Thank you very much. It's a, actually a pleasure to be here. This is actually uh, my first opportunity to address everybody given that I've been in the job just a little bit over a year now. Um, we've made some great changes this year and uh, hopefully this will give you an opportunity to see exactly what we've done this year and where we're going into the future. Um, I will take an opportunity to, I would like to introduce, I do have with me here today our bridge engineer Carl Hansen and our chief financial officer Crystal Knutson with me. Um, what I found in the last year is that there seems to be uh, a, a, either a, a misunderstanding or lack of understanding or just misrepresentation of what happens with the bridge and the bridge authority. And what I've been doing them in this last year is getting out and starting to talk to people to give them an understanding of what it is and how it operates. MDOT, Michigan Department of Transportation, owns the U.S. half of the bridge except for the toll plaza. That's 50% owned by MDOT, and the other 50% is owned by the Federal Bridge Corporation. Federal Bridge Corporation owns the Canadian half of the bridge and the plaza. They provide the board members to the bridge authority, four from each side, which then give us our governance and oversight, and we represent the bridge administration, and we operate the whole crossing on behalf of both owners in both countries with one staff. Um, our primary goal in our mission statement is obviously uh, safe and efficient movement of people across the border, but more importantly this year we're shifting maintaining and preserving the bridge and the asset because we want it to be here for the next 150 or 350 years. We have 50-50 staff, U.S. and Canadian, 32 full-time, 32 seasonal. We've increased our seasonal staff this year in order to accomplish a lot of our projects that we wanted to do in-house. Our focus is customer focus, is, is responsibility to the customer, Customer focus, quality, teamwork, pride, and integrity. And what we manage, we manage everything. Toll Plaza, the bridge, and Canada Customs under Canadian law. Canada Customs Act says that we operate and maintain the Canada Customs facility. Canada Customs is a rent-free tenant. We provide utilities, janitorial, and services to the facility. It's our responsibility, and that's what your tolls actually pays to maintain. And we are going to build for the future as well. Toll revenue, uh, I'm going to tackle this one right up front. Uh, commercial revenue, 8% of our traffic provides us 46% of our revenue. Our commercial traffic is subsidizing our, our, our revenue to maintain and support the bridge. Commuters, which are paying the, the, the least as far as customers are concerned, 250 US at a full 30% discount to cross or 322 Canadian, they're paying only 36%. Those commercial tra that commercial traffic is vital to our operations. So when you see traffic going up and down, don't look at that total traffic, look at that commercial traffic. I'd add too that there's $1.8 billion in goods that cross the International Bridge every year, both north and south. Half of that is raw materials going south and finished goods going north. Toll rates didn't change for 39 years and we started slowly incrementally increasing. Over the last two years, they've only gone up $2 US, that's it. We now offer discounted accounts online as well as uh, 10, 20, 30% discounts, uh, Visa, MasterCard, and debit online. I'm gonna make that plug right now. No expiry, please use it. Really important, inflation, 1968, what buys us with $1 today, or sorry, $8.20 today, was $1 in 1968. Rates didn't change for 40 years, so we made those dollars stretch as far as we could. Our operational expenditures in comparison, 25, $1,000 in 1968 is a $5.5 million operating budget today, which goes back into both communities. This was our capital plan last year. We had approximately $34 million in planned projects over the next 14, 15 years. And when we went to bid for some of our planned projects, they came back and they failed. So we took a very long, hard look at how we were going to continue to go forward because we couldn't continue the way we were. This is our capital asset management plan today. Very proud of the fact that the staff have contributed to ensuring and planning how this plan was going to be laid out. We're actually deferring almost all of that upwards of 15 years or more, and every year we're going to continue to reevaluate what needs to be done and continue to push and plan out further. The original deck on the bridge was scheduled to be replaced in 2012. Now it'll be 100 years old before we do that, and that's based on maintenance pra practices that we do annually on the bridge. 
How are we doing it? This was last year. Carl and, I and Crystal and I had a, a very rough moment in the office when we saw some of our bids come back with regard to our rail and our paint projects. As you can see today, we have paint projects going on up on the bridge. That's a three and a half million dollar project. Last year, that low bid was $6.6 .6 million. The high was 13.3. Obviously, we didn't have that in our funds. But today, these are pictures of what is going on up on the bridge. We're doing that project for $3.5 million. And the paint project, which is environmentally friendly and a single coat application, has the same lifespan as the original three coat system that was put on the bridge. So based at half the price, we're now shifting our maintenance plans in order to defer out or push out those long-term capital projects on the US arches upwards of 2030. So we're not planning for five years. We're planning for 30 and 40 years out. We have two contracted projects this year, Canadian Arch and a Rocker Link project that's on the south side. And our staff said, the projects that failed, we can do that. For $300,000 in additional staffing, which is benefit back to the communities with additional jobs, we took out $800,000 of contracted projects back in-house, $1.1 million in bearing replacements that need to be done on the bridge, and the US Arch. So almost $14 million in cash outlay save, which is going to help keep those rates where they are today in order to benefit both communities and keep the traffic flowing. And this was just a, another quick example of some of the other savings that staff also were able to do. Those arch lights that everybody gets to see and we have those lit this year with those LEDs, 55% energy savings, six years payback, 10 year warranty, 20 year expected life on all of those lights that are up on top of the arch as well as on the deck of the bridge. Uh, the Canadian Arch Paint Project, not only did the pressure washing, washer and some of the equipment that came through doing the paint project come back to help us with the paint project, but we started changing how we started doing the joints, the bridge moves back and forth, how we do the joint replacements. A four hour project was pushed down to 15 minutes, so we were able to better utilize our staff time and costs and spread it out to go and tackle other projects in the inspection reports for the bridge. Uh, the Canadian or the U.S. Uh, toll plaza, we saved 1.7 million dollars on the contracted project. That was 8.9 million dollars back into the community. Uh, in total, and, and these presentations are available online as well, uh, we were going to put almost 87 million dollars back into both communities with the plaza reconstructions. It's now valued at 40 percent of our total assets. When the bridge was built, bridge was built for 16 million dollars. Now we've got 87 and just plazas. The Canadian Plaza project is a more than halfway complete. We expect to have Canada Customs occupied and up and running and completed by the end of March of next year with the commercial traffic. So we'll be very happy to see that project completed. I might add too that uh, everybody was looking at the grants and the funding for the Canadian Plaza. Canadian Plaza was funded through Federal Bridge through border infrastructure funds to rebuild the plaza. However, Tolls paid for all the property purchases. There was a limited budget in order to acquire the properties in order for that plaza to expand. The border infrastructure grants did not cover for property acquisitions. And uh, I'm very proud of this. I, I can actually say we are now an award-winning team. Back in March, and these were surprises to us as the administration, but uh, the American Council of Engineering Companies of Michigan awarded their merit award for the plaza reconstruction on the border, and just recently in the last couple of weeks, the Michigan Transportation Asset Management Council awarded us with an organization, organization award on excellence in asset management. And of course, we've got time to celebrate in 2017 as well. Our, our staff have crossed the six year mark with no lost time injuries, working at 140 feet to 220 feet above the ground with concrete and steel. Very proud of that. That's our staff that's accomplishing that. We've had 20 plus peregrine falcons hatch on the bridge. We have four eggs that have now hatched up on the uh, underneath the US arch. Uh, the bridge walk this year is the 31st annual and it is on June 24th, the weekend before Engineers Day. In August, there's going to be the Great Lakes Hog Rally, uh, which is actually gonna include a, a parade on the bridge. And the Sioux International Festival of Races is coming up in September as well. Five minutes. That's great. Thank you for very much for that presentation. Mayor, we'll start with your commission. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for that presentation. And um, I guess the, the International Bridge Authority is be commended for, for the, um, I don't know, just the aggressive approach that you have uh, put together uh, since the retirement of the previous individual. Now you've got this, this uh, it looks like a new issues 
create being created and providing jobs. Let me ask you: the um, is the international bridge only funded by tolls? You know, you get you get help from the Michigan Department of Transportation. We do not get any help from the Michigan Department of Transportation at all with regard to funding. That's that's very interesting when you consider that you, the tolls pay for all of the maintenance, all of the. Um, administrative entity on the, on the bridge, so it's important that people continue to, to go back and forth and use that bridge as much as possible, but you're doing an exceptional job. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, any questions? Uh, Commissioner Gage. Peter, thank you for the presentation. Um, being the spouse of somebody who crosses that bridge every single day, um, I can certainly say that we have given you a lot of money uh, over the years. <laughs> um, can you maybe comment a little bit about some of the rumors I've heard about the bridge widening project and where that's at? I, you know, if, if that's a thing or... Um, to the Commissioner's question. Uh, we have applied four separate times now for funding for the bridge widening on the south side. We have maintained that uh, the issues with regard to the south side of the bridge is as a result of the reconstruction of the U.S. Customs facility. U.S. Customs is federally operated and it's funded by General Services Administration. We have not been successful. Those Federal, federally funded projects have been 10 times oversubscribed for the funds that are available versus the, the, the need, and we've just been unsuccessful. We are a very small piece of that. The most recent round has been a match for the grants. We just don't have the funds to be able to even match those requests. Council Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you uh, to Peter, um, there's a lot in the news recently about uh, potential uh, trillion dollar stimulus packages on, on the American side. If there is uh, funds available for any, uh, to advance any of the uh, projects that you've got, you know, over the next 20 or 30 years, is the, are you in a uh, position that you'll be able to execute those uh, sort of on short notice? Uh, to the council's question, actually, we have the preliminary plans already in place to be able to do the widening on the south side. That is our primary focus because I th we believe that that primarily will solve much of the traffic flow issues. And actually, I'd go a step further that our first priority should actually be the retaining walls on the plaza and not necessarily the bridge widening itself because even just moving out the retaining walls will allow for increased traffic flow where it's bottlenecking right now. Okay. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Lynn. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I'd really, what I'd really like to thank, to help maintain the bridge, is Canadians for cross-border shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Myers, how do I follow this guy? Um, two things. First of all, a request, um, Peter. Can you send uh, the PowerPoint presentation to? Uh, certainly, I know Malcolm in our. Our office, and I don't know if you want to, I don't know, if Michigan Commission probably would like it as well. If you can just send the PowerPoint to our clerks, then I'd like to have it, and that would be great. I know it's on your site that you mentioned, but if they send it to us as a file, then, then it's easier for, for us. And the other one is I just want to uh, compliment you and uh, all of the team that are there. Um, I realize that the the IBA is a big big family, and um, when we've had an opportunity to work on the International Bridge Walk over the years and so on, and I apologize for having the wrong weekend there. We want to make that clear. It's June 24, not Engineers Weekend, like I said. Sorry about that. But thank you. Um, it's really important. My background, as you know, is tourism marketing. Um, and it, I, I say to our um, border folks, some are my golf partners, um, we need you to stand on guard for our countries, our respective countries. And we do appreciate it if you can do it in the most friendly way possible. And I know that um, you're the bridge, you're not uh, the immigration, the customs, but you have a pretty close relationship. And if you would pass that on and your own people uh, from IBA, when we're crossing through these construction periods, they're always willing to have a smile and a wave. And uh, I think that I have great respect for the height at which they work and really want to thank you for your team. So actually to the council's comments, uh, we actually have presented, the, the PowerPoint is available. And with regard to the staff, I will definitely pass that on. We've got good working relationships with both the CBP and the CBSA port directors. I will make an added plug for a plea to the public to please pay attention to our staff out there, there too. It's six years with no lost time injuries, but it is vitally important that the ultimate safety 
for our staff out there is in the motoring public's hands. We have had instances with people running red lights up there. There is a reason for our staff to run out and stop folks too. There was a reason we put staff out there 24-7, 365 to get them through those work zones because it was vitally safe to, and we did not want to just trust automated lights. Thank you. Does it go over here? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Torney. Yeah, more of a comment too also, but um, when I look at the IBA release, and half of our commission now are small business owners, and I'm a second time small business owner now, I really look forward to the amount of people that are crossing over the bridge because that just means that our economy is, is being stimulated. And we go back and forth. I think sometimes we take for granted, at least I do, um, growing up here, the fact that I can just go to another country so my son can play hockey or just so I can get a great Italian meal. And, and when I talk to my friends and they're like, what do you mean you just went over to Pino's just to pick up some fresh bread or something? It's, it's kind of, people don't really realize, but that cross-border traffic is really, as a small business owner, what I'm looking for all the time. That means that my business is um, staying stable and speaking maybe on behalf of the rest of the small business owners here. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to pick up on those points. Recognizing the commercial traffic is the bread and butter the revenue. Uh, how, how does the exchange rate right now affect uh, commuter revenues? I, I would think that it's you know, by population, we're traveling over there more than vice versa. So how does the, can you quantify the effect of the exchange rate? Uh, to the council's question, actually, we, we not only can we quantify it, we can quantify it between Canadian and U.S. paying customers. Uh, accountant by trade now, uh, I, I actually opted not to include some more of the graphics that I normally <laughs> otherwise would have right. was thrown in there to, right. to, to maybe bore you. But... Um, there, there's really a, an inverse relationship between the exchange rate and auto traffic and our commercial traffic. Yeah. Our commuters are actually staying very stable. There's very little change, it, it's, which tells me from a commuter perspective that people go, that are crossing frequently are crossing on a regular basis. Right. When the Canadian dollar falls, it's those discretionary or those cash only customers that are paid that just don't come or stay home or maybe perhaps reduces some of our people that are going south for tourism or entertainment or whatever. But that's the same time when that Canadian dollar is down where our raw goods, materials, exports increase and head south. Mm -hmm. So th those two swing in opposite directions constantly. And, and sometimes media focuses on one versus the other. And it's vitally important that there, there, there's almost a sweet spot at about 85 cents where auto goes up and commercial goes up and everybody's happy. But we plan for stable, flat right. traffic. So it, yeah, there's, Thank there, you. there's a definite relationship. We're done. Any other questions on the matter? So thank you for your presentation. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Your Worship. Mr. Clerk. Our next item is a joint economic development presentation, revised MOU. We have Jeff Holt, EDC Director from Sioux, Michigan, and Tom Dodds, Chief Executive Officer, EDC from Sioux, Canada, here. After you. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity, uh, everyone. You'll see in your packet that uh, you'll see a revised um, understanding, two nations, one city. We had uh, been discussing that uh, in 2014 we came up with, uh, with the document, uh, the original document that's in your packet as well. And we thought it was time to revise and clean up the original document that is now three years old. And uh, so what we'll work with uh, myself and Al, uh, we'll work together to do a final draft uh, to present to uh, uh, to the groups, but uh, I thought I'd uh, throw this in there in case anyone has any comments. Uh, I did not change anything dramatically; uh, just uh, cleaned it up a little bit and uh, made it a little bit more uh, user friendly for everyone. And uh, so, but also in that theme, the you'll see in the document that there are um, in item B uh, number three, and it lists several of. Uh, goals that uh, we as a staff have uh, attempted to, or will attempt and have attempted to uh, to accomplish and I'd like to address a few of those 
number uh, A, which is trade, uh, between the Smart Zone and EDC offices in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and the Millworks uh, Center for Enterprise Excellence, I call it. Uh, I added that. Sorry, guys. Um, we work very closely. Uh, we, they've uh, really been a uh, guiding light for us to, uh, um, to create an environment for our young entrepreneurs. And uh, the facility is fantastic. I've been very fortunate to have been there several times. And uh, uh, hopefully our city commission can go there at one point. Uh, well, some of us have been in the <coughs> out there, but the, uh, the facility itself and the offices are, are so uh, inducive to uh, creativity. It's, uh, it's amazing. And uh, uh, we, we feed off of, off of the, uh, the millworks operation. We appreciate that. Manufacturing, uh, both value-added and forest products. Uh, some of you may know I was a U.S. customs broker and freight forwarder for many years. So when, when we talk trade, uh, I light right up. That was my first love, and, and uh, I'm pretty familiar with it. It's been a few years, but uh, I always enjoy working on, on trade issues. We have a couple of firms that I've expressed interest to, uh, to locate in Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, we're trying our best to accommodate them, and uh, they look very, very promising. It's hard work. Uh, with work visas and and uh, and everything else, but uh, uh, we're working very hard, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, hopefully success on both sides. Multimodal transportation and issues. Um, we have on on uh, the Michigan side, and I, I believe on the Canadian side as well, um, uh, tremendous transportation issues. We seem to be a long ways from everything at times. We hear that uh, on a regular basis. And quite frankly, we get tired of hearing it, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, but we partnered both the uh, Michigan EDC, the Sioux Ontario EDC, and Chippewa County EDC have gotten together and we've worked with the Eastern Upper Peninsula Regional Planning and Development Commission uh, to contract a professional firm to uh, devise a strategy that, that encompasses two goals. One is it discerns the feasibility of the UP as a micro multimodal transportation hub. And the second is the outlines a protocol for attracting logistic firms to the region. Part one of the strategy feasibility will analyze the region's existing transportation and industrial infrastructure, as well as the current market conditions. And it'll determine whether or not there is a demand for micro multimodal transportation hub in the Eastern UP. Part two of the strategy, which is uh, very important, is that uh, is, the, is the attraction to be fulfilled regardless of the findings in part one, to identify firms in logistics and related industries that are appropriate targets for the region, and devise a plan for pitching the region and require the contractor or subcontractor to collaborate with local economic development organizations in Michigan and Ontario, which will culminate in meetings with firms pitching them to the UP as location for their enterprises. This firm has already been identified and hired, and uh, they have been to the Sioux Ontario and Sioux Michigan EDCs and uh, have gotten tours and, and issues on transportation, and I think they've met with uh, Dan. And uh, so far, so good. So we're, we're hitting the ground running on, on transportation. And then I'd like to skip down to uh, item G, which is um, energy and environment. One of the issues that uh, we have on the U.S. side is not only the cost of our energy, which is, is high for everyone, but the availability of our energy for attracting large users for energy. And I have spoken to our president of the local energy utility, and he has informed me that a study is underway regarding Michigan and Ontario issues. The study is being done by MISO, M-I-S-O Energy. They're a regional transmission organization serving 15 states and parts of Canada. And since 2001, they've fostered wholesale electric competition, created greater system reliability, and established coordinated value based on regional planning. And I can have that website for anyone that, that needs it. I can perhaps forward it on. And what that'll do is that'll identify if there's, if there's um, energy available and what the cost would be. We've had a recent firm come to the Sioux, Michigan area 
uh, from the middle, middle uh, Atlantic states and indicated that they were interested in a large plant and uh, they were going to get their raw material in, in Ontario. And their, their project was energy based and they flat out that was priority, it was energy costs. And uh, so we're working very hard to try to come up with a solution and this will, this will help. And lastly, um, item J on your list, tourism and retail development. We formed a little over a year ago, the city manager and myself uh, formed a group called the Economic Resource Alliance. And that includes many of our area uh, providers, if you will. And uh, Tony Haller from the Chamber of Commerce is here and he's part of that group. And what we've done is we've tried to come up with a, a think tank, if you will, and a clearinghouse for anyone that is uh, needing a business, want to start a business, want to expand their business, or if they're in trouble. And we have uh, had tremendous success in not only attracting potential business owners, but businesses that um, would like to adjust their marketing and business plans. We provide business plans and marketing plans at no cost through the Small Business and Development Center, and we can offer them, we like to think, a one-stop shop for um, development, whether it's manufacturing, retail, that's okay. Um, so we've identified uh, the tourism and retail development as well. And with that, um, I would like to uh, then now turn it over to my partner here, Al, and he'll, he'll take it away. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, just a couple of add-ons uh, to what Jeff said. Uh, the Two Nations, One City uh, document that we were discussing is uh, something that was a natural outcome of the Celebrate 100 events in the city, uh, signing off a relationship agreement with, uh, uh, with the two cities, and this, this was a natural fallout from economic development. Um, we have this formal structure, but uh, frankly, I think what's been more, even perhaps more effective in many respects is the ongoing dialogue that uh, Dan Hollingsworth and so for those that don't know Dan, Dan is here right now, uh, have had on an ongoing basis uh, and really sort of open the door for businesses in Canada to capitalize on the fact that we have a, a relationship with the city uh, across the river and, and, and vice versa. And um, We have some synergies we take for granted, uh, you know, that in terms of our, clearly on the social side we know them, but on a business side, and we've had discussions before with Mayor Bospis and others, many of the things that we have in terms of retail is a function of the market that is on the other side of the river. So we are kind of have a symbiotic relationship in that respect. And so that kind of local trade uh, has largely benefited from that. Um, I would mention a couple of things. In terms of education, I wanted to point out that uh, Dan Hollingsworth sits on a, a professional advisory committee for Lake State uh, in business and in engineering. And uh, essentially, that, the, if there's something that we really have shared very much, it's the incubator that you have at Le in, in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Michigan. And similarly, the one we have in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. There's been a lot of dialogue on how each can capitalize on the other. Um, in terms of health, and we have Tony Anderi here, who's uh, we've worked with and uh, with Sioux Area Hospitals and the Moore Mile Hospital. Um, it's been a little late in coming, slow in coming to fruition, but the objective is what synergies can we realize from the other hospital? Uh, you know, there are, there are very basic things that are necessary to operate both facilities, and then there's other, th other things from a diagnostic imaging perspective that um, we may have a piece of equipment or we maybe have certain services here uh, that may be capitalized on by our American friends and vice versa, our Canadian Canadian folks can go over and get and get the services in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, unless instead of having to travel to other locations. I think that that kind of is coalescing a bit more assertively over the last little while, but I think that's a very important one. Anything that will bring the cost down and presumably we can get through the red tape for each of the uh, um, institutions, I think is a, a really critical piece of the puzzle. Now, in terms of some of the other things that we have, I mean, and I, I would say this almost, uh, um, you know, somewhat facetiously, we have remarkable broadband that provides redundancy across the river for us. I don't know what the implications are for uh, the U.S. side, but it helps us with respect to the lottery, uh, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. It gives us that that sort of extra margin. Um, and I would say that from an e-commerce perspective, there are certainly two or three institutions in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, that certainly benefited uh, from the fact that uh, e-commerce is live and living in Sault Ste. Marie. 
Um, the other point I would make is that there are some synergies that we can explore from an aviation standpoint. We've quite a good relationship with our airport development corporation, and you have had some recent um, some recent announcements with regard to the, the Sault Ste. Marie acting as a center as well for aviation. I think those are really important. And I and and going forward. Um, Issues like transportation, issues like the multimodal, uh, people forget and we brought forward the case to the province of the fact that, um, you know, there's a multimodal exercise for Northern Ontario. We've pointed out that there is, which was not showing on the map, that there is a bridge that goes across the states in terms of rail. And, uh, and that's something that both sides can capitalize on. So the study that, that Jeff has referred to, I think, is a lo logical piece of linking together. So I, I think that what we need to do, and I spoke with the board at our meeting today, that uh, we'd like to invite uh, our counterparts in Sault Ste. Marie, Mission to, Michigan, to a meeting. We can probably finalize this document and similarly have sort of an informal get-together on both sides of the river and get sort of the more formal aspects of this thing rolling. So with that said, I'm happy to entertain questions. Well, thank you both gentlemen for your presentation. Mary, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. And again, uh, thank you both. Uh, it's exciting times. Um, what do we have to do as a commission to um, expedite the, uh, the signing and the meetings, or is that something that you're just going to take care of? I, I would just say that the, the, the two, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the two um, municipalities have signed an agreement. Yes. A sub-component of that is this thing joint international relations and yes. growth the juric that's what we have to do so i think that okay. Okay. In, you know we'll let you we'll let you know oh. but i and certainly be happy to have it, it's sure it's exciting times when you listen to what some of the things that are going on and and could be happening here in the near future and um with that we'll entertain some uh questions from our commission if there are any commissioner gage i'll, I'll keep it short but i just um Tom and, and Jeff, I both respect uh, you individually and, and the work that you do on behalf of both of our communities. Looking at this list, I think you know some of the most important ones that drop, jump out of my mind are the multimodal transportation and logistics and um, energy environment. I had to laugh a little bit about healthcare because one of these days we'll figure out that you guys have the right answer and we'll get single payer healthcare <laughs> as well. But I can say that now because I'm leaving the commission. Um, <laughs> Um, but in terms, I don't know if you if you are prepared maybe to comment or to, to, to give more kind of insight into that. I don't want to go too deep into the woods on this, but um, in terms of logistics and multimodal transportation, is there any more movement on um, a certain port that has been discussed? Well, I, I, the, the port of Algoma is alive and living. I mean, it, it, it has activity and so forth, but the the, the future of, of, the, of that whole um, area and the relationship is still being sorted out. It's under the, the U.S. equivalent of Chapter 11. Um, uh, but I think from our perspective, and I, I won't speak for the Council, but from the Economic Development Corporation, it's a top uh, economic infrastructure priority for us. Uh, there are efforts underway to get ready in the, at the time, at which time that the, this whole process gets itself sorted out, which we all would like sooner rather than later. Uh, but it is what it is, and so um, it, it's still very much on our radar. Well, this is a quick follow-up. Jeff, let's just, uh, you know, do an end run around while they're busy here, you know, like, let's get it on our side. So <laughs> there's your marching orders. Okay. <laughs> City Council, Councillor Fada. Thank you very much. Um, just a, one question. I, in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, I think it's safe to say that our, our population has been trending downwards, and... Um, Actually, a friend of mine, an accountant who's very good with numbers, um, he thinks the population in Sault Ste. Marie here is about uh, 66,000 people. And uh, I'm just wondering, do either one of you give us, uh, can give us a pretty clear indication of what the population is in, on, uh, on both sides of the river? Would you have an, an idea on uh, either side? Councillor <laughs> Fada, I imagine that Mr. Dodds on the Canadian side is going to go with the census. The, the, the census. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, if Mr. Dodds wants to proclaim a different answer, he's welcome to do that. I, I would just, I would just point out that in a market, from a market area perspective, um, you know, we're about seventy-eight thousand, and then that doesn't include, for example, the area of Sioux, what I would call Sioux North, mm -hmm. uh, and then I would defer to, to Jeff about what the population is best he knows for, for the other side of the river. Ed, 
I don't have the exact figures, but I want to say 13,000, uh, 13, five, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, 14, three. 14, three. Okay. We, we've been we've been busy the last. And that's couple just years. the sewer area, but you're talking about the greater Chippewa County areas of 50, 52,000 type right. of thing. So um, that's a number we like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just as a, a, just as a rule, when we describe the two, uh, we use kind of 125 as our kind of number. Yeah. Uh, you Easily. Know, but people yeah. talk about what's the market in that immediate area. Mm -hmm. I think Councillor Fada had a follow up. No, I, I'm just I'm just you know all of us are always concerned about what we can draw here in terms of po what our population draws. And then we, we look at both sides of the river and, and, the, and, and the area, and it, it's important that people realize that it's not uh, two small cities here. It's uh, all combined with the area. I think it's important that uh, if we want to draw, you know, draw certain uh, sectors of the economy here, we, you know, it's certainly nice to know that it's not just a city of you know, 13 or so thousand and somewhere around 70 some thousand. And because uh, I know there's always talk about people uh, you know, drawing, I mean, this is uh, just uh, like big box stores and they, and they look at the population, they go, well, they, they, they need 100,000 people before they'll even entertain the thought. But it's nice to know that, 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 it, that the area is actually much more than that. So, it acts more of a drawing power, I guess, is, uh, is certainly important. I, I just make this observation. We just got information from a conference board of Canada. If there's any part of our economy that's growing, it's the retail side. It's growing overall. And I would it'd be fair to say that you wouldn't have, as an example, two Walmart superstores plus an additional Walmart mm -hmm. in the close proximity that they have, given that when you move beyond the two urban centers, the distribution of population is quite modest. And you know, you really the catchment area, even if you were to go an hour out, is not really that great. It's on either side, so it speaks to the issue of, you know, that we do have that capacity because there's a certain rep reciprocity across the river. Just one more point, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, in terms of the, you were recently up in Sioux Lookout, uh, Tom, and uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, Ring of Fire, like, was there any part of that conversation included uh, traffic? On, the, on our bridge and in any way involving the, uh, the, our friends to the south? Like, did anywhere during that conversation, did uh, that come up as far as the... The attention of the, um, the relationship is, imagine us as two hubs. And the first hub is going from truck, meaning from the mine site in north, northern Ontario, very remote northern Ontario, down to Sioux and that would go on to rail. And then from rail, it would go on to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, the proposal is, for processing to go out by boat. Right now, the end users are all on water. So I, it, would be, it would be surprising, apart from raw materials coming in, that we would use um, the, 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 the commercial um, truck you know, the, auto, the, the sort of the, the bridge itself, uh, we would only use the train bridge, if anything at all. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just, um, as, as a footnote, ask our city manager to just comment on the economic alliance that has been formed. Uh, thank you for that question, Mayor. Certainly, as referenced by EDC Director Holt, uh, the Economic Resources Alliance is effectively a consortium of those organizations within our community that play a role in economic development. So you have the City of Sault Ste. Marie, the Downtown Development Authority, the Economic Development Corporation, uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Small Business Development Corporation, Sioux Area Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Eastern Upper Peninsula Regional Planning and Development Commission, the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, and Lake Superior State University, among others. And so each organization meets on a monthly basis and exchanges information and aligns our operations to make sure that we're leveraging our assets in an effective manner. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Commission? So we have Councillor Myers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, draw back, hearken back to a one of the greatest examples we've ever had between our twin twin sister cities working together had to be the ABC bowling bid. <laughs> 
I look at Commissioner Lynn and I know that I have Councillor Butlin behind me and we even created a beer with a label and, and that's really where the Two Nations One City was born. Um, that was in the early 90s, I believe, uh, when we uh, had to go to Reno, Nevada and make a presentation and it was about a three month um, event that, that had we been successful we would have had here. But quite frankly, um, I was in the tourism office at the time and we had to create an international pitch uh, to host this event in our twin sister cities. And it was quite an incredible experience for about two years that we worked on that bid. And we had a, a great committee with both of these men, uh, mayors at the time. And really, uh, for myself, I, it was my first foray of working with a city council, too, on an initiative. And then I went and ran anyway when I retired, I don't know. But um, th there's a close relationship on the tourism player side that um, has been going on for many, 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 many years. And we mark at one another's um, uh, tourism assets. I can remember being at a trade show in Milwaukee uh, on one occasion when somebody said to me, you mean the Agawa Canyon doesn't leave from Ashman Street in Sioux, Michigan? No. <laughs> um, so we, we mark it very closely and this whole idea of the two nations, one city, I think is, is more than a slogan for us. And so I really have a lot of respect for what our two EDCs do and um, you know the tourism uh, arms of those two organizations as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other questions? And I do remember the bowling congress. Um, I think Sue Ontario was going to spend several million dollars in, in putting up a building if, if we could get, have gotten that. And I know uh, Mary Lynn at the time was uh, traveling around the, the countryside. Uh, every chance they got to go, uh, uh, Mayor Butlin was uh, always. It was it was a great uh, it was a it was a great experience. I'm sure um, just putting that together, uh, Commissioner uh, Lynn, former mayor, you'd like to comment. Yeah, that was it was really a great time, how we worked together on this. Uh, matter of fact, I still have the beer from uh, <laughs> Doran's, okay? Uh, but I was, I was disappointed it didn't happen due to the fact that uh, Sue Ontario didn't want to come up with the nine or 10 million and we had our $2.98 all set to go. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great experience. And they told us that uh, money didn't matter. Remember that, Steve? So we get in there and we did, they said, you did the best job of anybody. But the problem is, I think it was Knoxville, Kentucky, come in with a check for 250,000, we were gone. It was just like that. But it was, a, it was a great time. I think this is where it all started. Councilor Shoemaker. Thank you. I, uh was probably a bit young when that was going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or not born, Councilor <laughs> Yes, yes, precisely. Um, but I did have uh, a question for the city uh, manager uh, from Sioux, Michigan. Uh, you had mentioned that the uh, all the parties involved in this, uh, in this initiative, and you had mentioned that there was a downtown uh, development bureau on your side. But I didn't hear, is our downtown association part of this? Perhaps our CAO could answer that? I think Mr. Dodds has an answer here. Yeah. Mr. Dodds, if you can just go to the mic. First of all, I, I'm delighted to hear that you've got that affiliation with the various parties on your side. I think it's a great idea. I'm not aware, and Al, I see Al saying the same, I'm, we're not aware of that, but it may be something as one progresses through this, uh, uh, that we'd be part of that as, you know, we think about our counterpart as well to pull those groups together. I think that is a, another piece of the puzzle, perhaps, that we can move forward on. Okay, okay. that'd be great, thanks. If I may, uh, they're always welcome at our table, always. And uh, we could probably get uh, uh, Tony to pass along uh, information uh, through his counterpart on this side to, uh, to spread the word, and we'll get it to Al as well. Um, it's. It's uh, kind of a roundtable discussion. It's not, it's not very formal, um, but we talk about issues. Uh, the last, I believe, two meetings ago, we invited a, uh, a person that opened a small business, and we wanted to hear the good and the bad. And uh, there were some challenges, uh, obviously, but uh, we wanted to hear what they were about and try to avoid that in future endeavors. And, and I know that... Uh, um, uh, Council, um, Council Twardy is uh, very, very in tune with that, and uh, we're, we're very pleased with our, our results so far. Always welcome. 
Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I don't see any from our sides. Mr. Clerk? Thank you. No, oh, sorry. Well, I missed one. Councilor Buttonland, I apologize. I'm not used to looking that far to the right or that far to the left for, for, for questions. I'm a member of the peanut gallery now after all these years. <laughs> and Bill Lynn, I'm really embarrassed that he's at the front table and I'm at the back table. It's totally inappropriate. <laughs> Good to see you, Bill. Um, I'm, there was mention of the energy uh, uh, initiative and I have a personal interest in that and your governor has said let's talk to our Ontario neighbors about the potential of us selling some of our excess energy to the Upper Peninsula and that would involve certainly Sioux, Michigan and uh, Dan Dasho who is very keen about this and you, you did mention it's Cloverland Electric is it? Yes. And um, so I'm participating <coughs> in a a teleconference uh, on Thursday and in speaking to these folks uh, in, in Lansing we are very much a part of this study. Sioux Michigan, Sioux Ontario maybe not specifically but we are the uh, the most logical connecting point between the two. So we are on the table and the study is being conducted as we speak and will be completed in December. And I think it would be a good opportunity, I may have missed the boat on this, I don't know, but uh, of uh, going together. It's going to be a financial decision, let there be no doubt, but there are some political uh, overtones mm -hmm. to the whole thing. So uh, I, I will reach out, hopefully, to, we have a, uh, an informal uh, committee of uh, councillors on this side, Councillor Shoemaker and Krompadich, and maybe we could have a, a political uh, meeting and, and move together to lobby that this is a, a good location to do this. I've had a developer come and say it's a great idea and we're prepared to invest monies in something like this. So there could be mutual benefit to this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. In um, just a comment about the uh, electrical uh, situation in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. La uh, two years ago, we weathered the storm and we were going to see increases well into the uh, 60, 70 percent for businesses. And it was, um, it was going to pretty much take the lights out in the, in the UP. And that was with uh, MISO and, and FERC. And now when Commissioner Gage's new role as the UP representative, he's going to be much more familiar at the federal level with the electric uh, utilities and those entities that um, are responsible for setting rates. So we would certainly rely on him going forward that um, the, uh, the, we cannot have that, uh, and it's still on the horizon. Um, uh, former Mayor Butland, the, the electric charges uh, coming forward are still out there and we had, well, they, haven't, they really haven't uh, answered the questions yet or come to any conclusion. And we in the Eastern UP are paying for a, a plant in um, the middle of the, of the UP that we draw no electric power from. And um, those electrical increases could be devastating to the, to the whole UP, especially uh, the Eastern UP. So that's something on the horizon that's not gone away and we're going to have to uh, continue to be um, vigilant, or diligent and, uh, or, and vigilant on both those entities. But we, we know that uh, Commissioner Gage will be on top of that once he uh, takes over and that. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Clerk. Our next item, Sue Locke's project update. Kevin Sprague, Area Engineer, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is in attendance. Welcome, Mr. Sprague. Thank you. And thank you for uh, providing me the opportunity to uh, speak and, and talk about our, uh, our new lock project or potential new lock project. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our project, uh, why it's needed. Uh, how we, as an agency, analyze and compete uh, projects for funding, uh, where we are with the economic study that we currently have underway, and then uh, hopefully I can answer some uh, questions if you have any. But uh, right now, 86% of all the uh, cargo 
that uh, flows through the, the sulox is restricted to the, uh, the Polak. And that, that's due to the, the size of the vessels. Vessel sizes have uh, grown over the years, um, especially the, the wider vessels. Uh, it's, it's a lot more efficient to move cargo that way. And uh, as a result, uh, we've, uh, we, we've got a situation where we, we, uh, we need more redundancy. We don't, we don't need another lock because of a, a capacity issue. There's really no, uh, no significant delays to ships that are using the facility. It it's really comes down to the fact that if, if the pole were to go out of service for any significant amount of time, it would, it would have pretty significant uh, national economic consequences. Um, I want to talk about how we uh, how we analyze and uh, and complete uh, or compete, excuse me, for, for funding. And then there, there's two basic uh, ways for us to get uh, funding. Uh, and, and one way, you know, Congress can uh, directly appropriate uh, funds for a specific project. Uh, but more commonly and typically, the Corps of Engineers has a construction general fund that, that Congress appropriates money to. And then we uh, we, we compete. We do. Uh, economic studies on projects and come up with benefit cost ratios. And then they compete with other projects nationwide and, and that's how you rack and stack which ones have the top priority. Um, what happened uh, in 2006, the, the benefit cost uh, study that was completed uh, came up with the result of uh, 0 0.73 for, for a new lock at, at the Sioux. Uh, the, uh, to be policy compliant, uh, benefit cost ratio has to be above one for the project to be budgetable. Uh, and, and so obviously that's a, that's a problem. Uh, in 2009, Congress earmarked $17 million for construction. Uh, what we did with that money is we, we built uh, two coffer dams where the fourth lock is in preparation of uh, building a new lock, and that's the, where the location will be. We also deepened our, uh, our east approach from 23 and a half feet to uh, 29 feet deep, and that was drilling and blasting through, through bedrock. But uh, right after that, uh, Congress uh, stopped, uh, stopped doing earmarks. So, so that, uh, that method isn't out there anymore. So uh, just a couple years ago in 2014, we, we got together with industry. We had... Uh, uh, we partnered with the steel industry, the mining industry, uh, the shipping, and even rail participated. And, and we went through the, uh, the previous uh, study that had been completed to, to analyze it and see, see what was wrong because something didn't seem right. 0 0.73 did not make sense to anybody, uh, but we had to, that's our process and we had to figure out what was wrong. Well, there were some assumptions we found that had been made with that, with that study. Uh, one of them was uh, that the future reliability of the facility was going to go to 100 percent in the year 2017. That's this year, I guess. Uh, they they assumed that uh, the whole facility would have been uh, recapitalized, rebuilt by that point, and so thus would have been 100 percent reliable. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, we're actually in the middle of an asset renewal program, but that's just to keep us going with the current equipment, and, uh, and that will continue for many years to come. But the, the other. Uh, the other assumption was that alternate modes of transportation uh, were available such that all commodities could move by rail at no additional cost if the locks were not available suddenly. That's, that's false. You know, the rail infrastructure does not exist to get from the mines to the, the steel mills in particular. And the majority of the steel mills on the Great Lakes can only accept uh, iron ore by, by vessel. Um, they're, they're, they accept coal by rail, but uh, their ore fields are on the lakeside. Uh, the other thing was they assumed that all new ships would be uh, smaller and would fit in the Mac lock. So, so there's, there's obviously a lot of problems. So, so we uh, we started a new study here in the past year. And uh, well, before I go into that, um, you know the four the four major or main commodities that come through the facility are iron ore, uh, stone, uh, wheat, and uh, uh, coal. And coal is our number two commodity. Iron, iron ore by far has the most uh, significant uh, impact nationally. There's uh, there's 11 integrated steel mills in America, three in Canada that, that are operating today. Uh, three are in Canada, and, and the other eight are in the U.S. Uh, they are uh, they are reliant on that taconite. Our, our, our North American steel industry as far as integrated mills have evolved to using the taconite pellet. All their material handling, everything is set up around that. It's a very efficient way to, to do business. But uh, right now, 100% of all the ore mined in the United States flows through the Sioux Locks. 
uh, up until just uh, in the last uh, month or two, the port of Escanaba closed. Uh, there, that was the only port outside of Lake Superior that was uh, shipping uh, taconite pellets. But with the closure of the uh, Empire Mine outside of Marquette, that port is now closed. So it's 100%. 100%. 100%. Goes through those locks. Right. So there's, uh, and so then all of the U.S. mills uh, receive 100% of their ore from, through, through the locks. If you were to go down and, uh, including, uh, I, I would say, you know, SR here in town, they don't need the locks from a, from a taconite perspective, but coal and stone for making coke come through the locks to serve them. Uh, if you look at, uh, I think it's, the other two mills are in Nanticoke and Hamilton. Uh, one of them gets probably about a third of their ore through the locks and they're getting the rest from Quebec, I think. And then, but the other ones, uh, I think 100% as well. So it, it's fairly significant and uh, extremely significant. And uh, so we, we, we started this new study and uh, that study has been marching along uh, and it was scheduled to be completed for uh, December 2017. So we just got our 2017 work plan about two weeks ago, and we uh, we discovered that the uh, funding that uh, was required to complete that study had been removed unexpectedly. So right now we're in a situation where we have efforts underway to try to reprogram funds for, from other projects to, to complete this study. And where we're at now is that uh, by the time we get reprogrammed funds, it'll be another six months before we can we can complete the study. So we're, we're in a, a delay situation right now. Well, that's kind of where I was going to end up. But I mean, it's not all negative. We've got a lot of, a lot of good uh, uh, press right now. We've got a lot of political support, a lot of industrial support. It's, it's a bipartisan support. You know, it's, not a, it, it's not a partisan issue at all. It, it's really a regional. I think across our region, people really understand what's going on, and, and, and uh, we're, we're doing pretty good that way. But that's kind of all I have for now, and I hope. But, <laughs> but, but notwithstanding that, somebody removed the money. <laughs> notwithstanding that, yeah, that, that was uh, uh, an issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. May, Mayor, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's no question the importance to the city of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and the surrounding area if the new lot were to actually become a project. And uh, it's, it's interesting to note that they have spent nearly $50 million already in the engineering, the coffer dams, uh, some other uh, things that are going on that are in preparation for a, a new lock, um, much like the pole lock. Um, anything that Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and I know, know you've, you've uh, written letters on, on our behalf, on the Corps' behalf, uh, to make uh, this come to fruition because of, of the uh, economic impact that that would be over a maybe a 12-year, 15-year period. And now it's up to, I believe, it's close to a billion dollars. Uh, initially, 500 million. Um, when you're looking now, it's, it's, it's close to a billion dollars, I would guess. And um, uh, so that, uh, certainly thank uh, Kevin for his, his report, and he continues to uh, do what they need to do in preparation for the eventual, um, hopefully, um, undertaking when they're, when they're going to do that. So um, any questions from uh, Commissioner Torney? Thank you. Um, well, not to put more pressure on Commissioner Gage, but I know this is more <laughs> of yeah, a state, it's not exactly. really a state issue, it's more of a federal issue, but yes. it's going to be really great having Jay representing the UP and the locks, and thanks for being here, Kevin. Just to put into perspective, so uh, let's just take the Paul Tregurtha, for example, and, and I know that you said that it's not even possible to put uh, to transport all those commodities uh, via rail, but right. just if, if you could put it into perspective, because I think the Tregurtha carries what 127,000 metric tons. Is oh, that uh, yeah, 70,000 net ton it can it can handle, which is okay. I don't I can't remember figures real well, but it's it's uh, several several many many train sets. It's like 2,500 trucks or something yeah, crazy. Yeah. Thing. But, yeah. So when you talk about the time commitment of trying to transport all that via truck or rail. It's so much more time consuming and it's so much more efficient to have the, the ships going on the waters. I, it's, it's necessary and I, and I just blows my mind. <laughs> they can't see that the backup, and I know that the PO, you need to be able to do some maintenance on it because there are things that are aging on that lock also. So right. you can't really shut the lock down. 
to yeah, do so that. There, there's some items that we, uh, we, we have an asset uh, renewal program in place. So we're, we're marching through all of our major equipment and recapitalizing it. We actually have some equipment that's over 100 years old that we still use on a, you know, for dewatering the locks and such. But uh, yeah, as, as, the, as, we, as we get into it, there, there's certain things on the, on the PO that we, we cannot uh, recapitalize without uh, shutting down navigation for several months. And that, that's just not, uh, that's not tenable, that, that, that won't happen. So, so with, with a second lock, we could actually take on those, those next uh, phases of maintenance on, on the pole lock. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a significant number of questions about this issue because it is a critically important one to our, both of our economies, but I'm gonna defer to the city council here. So we'll start with Council Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in uh, September 2015, uh, after I think what was a nine or 11 day shutdown, as I understand that summer of both locks, uh, or it may have been nine days of one of the locks and one or two days of another one, um, but, the, but that caused some significant uh, uh, issues for, for Great Lakes shipping. Councilor Christian and I brought a motion uh, and that motion had the support to support, you know, the construction of a new lock. Obviously, there's only so much we could do on our side. This is a, it is a U.S. federal issue, but we understand our council. I think uh, fair to say understands the critical nature of this lock to our economic development. So uh, that resolution expressing our unreserved support for the Sum new Sumitian lock uh, had the support of SR Steel, Port of Algoma the Sault Ste. Marie Chamber of Commerce and the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. So uh, across not only our community, but across our entire province, this is uh, understood to be a critical uh, piece of infrastructure for regional economic development and, uh, and economic development of the entire Great Lakes region. So uh, there was also shortly after the summer of 2015 uh, shutdown, a uh, number of articles written in the Detroit Free Press that, that expressed how uh, significant of, a, uh, of an impact a shutdown in both locks would be. And I think it, you know, I, I'm going off the top of my head here uh, from recollection, but I think it was something like there would be a 25% dip in economic activity in the, in the Great Lakes states and provinces for the period of the shutdown after six months. So, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, critical to not only us, but you know, Michigan, Ontario, both uh, Twin Cities, uh, but as well, you know, the entire Great Lakes region. So, nothing uh, could be more vital to our joint interests than the new lock. If in any way we could be helpful uh, in in you know uh, getting uh, whoever it was that that took the uh, funds out for the uh, for the uh, study to put them back in, we'd be happy to support it, I'm sure, with resolution, uh, expressing our uh, belief that this is an important issue. So whatever we can do to help, I know that Council will endorse it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Gage. Well, you certainly knew I was going to talk about this one. Uh, <laughs> but um, as you guys may or may not uh, be aware, um, this past Friday, uh, Senator Stabenow was able to um, put together a group of, of dignitaries to come and tour the locks. We had Senator Stabenow, Senator Peters, uh, Governor Snyder, and then Congressmen uh, Bergman, Trott, Lawrence, Upton, and I believe I'm Dingle as well, um, tour the locks. So, so one of the things that's really important here right now is that everyone is kind of coming together bipartisanly and understands it. And what we've got to do as a strategy is, is not only, I mean, make sure that the flawed study is done, and I think that we're pretty much done with the study now, right? Or the, the, new, the new contingency study? Oh, well, that's, uh, that right. has another six months of work to go. Okay, so, okay, yeah. so it's, but it's being worked on currently. Well, it's come to, it's stopped, yeah. Okay. Yeah, with, with no funding, it has to, has to stop. Okay, um, but I think one of the things that's so important is to continue to put pressure on it and to continue to talk about it and to continue to bring it up because um, like, like my colleague from the, the Canadian side said, you know, it, it could create an actual recession, national recession for both of our economies. Um, and it's, it's incredibly um, important. Um, you know, Kevin, I appreciate your, your report. You do a fantastic job. I have to laugh though because when you, you mentioned that you had to deal with things that you still use that are 100 years old, 
I have to say I don't have much sympathy for you because we have to deal with commissioners that are over 100 years old. And we have to make <laughs> Not for but, long. Uh, <laughs> I have to get my pot shots in now. Um, but certainly, um, you know, the, the, the importance of this is, is, is crucial. And um, thank you for all your work. And, and I really look forward to being an advocate on your behalf and our behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Christian. Mr. Mayor, I'm going to withhold my question. Anyone else? Sure. Councilor Fada? Just a, um, your opinion on this item, but um, I understand that our government will be funding 100% of the new bridge in Windsor. Does that have any influence on the federal government to, <laughs> as far as... Uh, I, 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 yeah, I doubt it. But, you know, it's... Uh, th there were... Uh, uh, you know, the, the project was authorized in, in uh, what, 1987, and then there was another uh, uh, update to the Waterway Resource Development Act. At one point, it was supposed to be partially funded by Canada. Every, every state was supposed to uh, pony up a certain amount of money, uh, including Canada was going to pony up so much, and, and the federal government, the other 50 percent, I think. Uh, there was a lot of, a lot of trouble getting everybody to buy off that. You know, Michigan and Minnesota stepped up right away, but not everybody understood how that could impact them as much. So that, uh, that act actually made it 100% federally funded, which uh, was actually good for the project. It make, makes things a lot simpler for us. Just one follow-up, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, I understand that the, the, the new administration in, in the U.S. mentioned something about a trillion dollar infrastructure. Is any, any part of that uh, have maybe some optimism for you as far as... Uh, yeah, well, one of the things, uh, the, the president uh, released his top 50 infrastructure projects, and we were on that list. So that, that was, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's definitely not a bad thing. But again, we, you know, we have an authorized project, but you know, we need the appropriation now to be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Clerk. Our next item is Great Lakes Resolution. We have a resolution that's uh, going to be uh, moved and seconded jointly so that it's an official uh, motion for each uh, body. I've uh, moved by Councillor Shoemaker and Commissioner Gage and seconded by Councillor Myers and Commissioner Twardy. Whereas in 1909, the Boundary Waters Treaty was signed by the governments of the United States and Canada, which started the formal process of creating the International Joint Commission to deal with issues facing our shared water boundary. And whereas the two governments then signed the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972, which extended this approach to include issues facing the Great Lakes. And whereas several treaties, laws, and initiatives have been developed and implemented by the governments of the United States and Canada to protect, maintain, and restore the Great Lakes, now, therefore, be it resolved that Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario City Council and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan City Commission call upon our local, provincial and state and federal stakeholders to advocate for continued financial support for programs that protect, maintain and restore our Great Lakes. And further be it resolved that copies of this joint resolution be sent to the Honourable Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, Terry Sheehan, Member of Parliament for Sault Ste. Marie, <coughs> The Honourable Kathleen Wynne, Premier of Ontario, Ross Romano, Member of Provincial Parliament for Sault Ste. Marie, the United States President Donald J. Trump, United States Senator Debbie Stabenow, United States Senator Gary Peters, United States Congressman Jack Bergman, the Governor of Michigan Rick Snyder, State Senator Wayne Schmidt, and State Representative Lee Chatfield. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Hello, let's start okay. with you, Mayor. Sure. Uh, do we have a motion? Or do we have the motion already? Oh, it's been uh, roll call, moved please. And Mayor Bospis? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Bauer? Yes. Commissioner Gage? Yes. Commissioner Gary? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. Commissioner Twardy? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Before we call the vote, Council, Council Schumacher, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, obviously, I couldn't let a council meeting go by, even an international council meeting, without having a motion on the agenda. So uh, thanks to Commissioner Gage for uh, really putting this together. Uh, we had talked about a couple of options, and uh, this was one that I think uh, uh, both, uh, both uh, 
that councils could agree was important to our joint interests. We have an interest in making sure that the Great Lakes uh, are clean and remain clean and are well looked after uh, by by um, by both you know by both the uh, jurisdictions that that border it, Michigan and Ontario. So uh, there have been proposals out there to reduce the funding for the uh, Great Lakes. Uh, uh, water quality initiatives and uh, and you know it's our hope that those proposals don't come to fruition that in fact uh, the money that's there to make sure uh, that the Great Lakes are maintained in a uh, excellent uh, uh, state and that they are here for our enjoyment and our future enjoyment uh, and that uh, you know we we can continue to see the improvements that we've seen I think you know over the last 50 years from from a point where they were sort of uh, their cleanliness and, and the pollution of them was a secondary thought to where it is the main thought uh, that that you know of all all municipalities and and industry that border on them so uh, I think it's important that we um, support this I'd like to thank you both I think it's a tremendous motion I think it's a really productive a motion to come out of a joint meeting it shows the, the importance of this issue and the importance of our shared water. Um, would you like a recorded vote, Councillor Shoemaker? Yeah, of course, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clerk, you can have a recorded vote, please. Recorded vote has been requested. Councillor Chirko? Four. Councillor Fada? Four. Councillor Myers? Four. Councillor Christian? Four. Councillor Nero? Four. Councillor Shoemaker? Four. Councillor Bruni? Councillor Butland. Four. Mayor Provenzano. Four. Mayor Putland. <coughs> motion passes unanimously. So, Mr. Clerk, it looks like we're on item eight. We are. And that is <clears throat> a city flag exchange. I think we're going to do it right up here. Yeah. So, I don't know if we have anybody here to formally take a picture. That camera's on, so everybody's. <coughs> Do you want to open right up? Sure, why not? Council Shoemaker's going to be really really proud right now. <laughs> we recently yeah, changed that's, our flag. Yes, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> there we go. Here. There it is. Somebody's trying to take care. Let's go this way. The problem with opening them is yeah. you're supposed to touch the yeah. ground. Yeah. yeah. So let's go this way. Oh. All right. There we are. No, the other way. There. There you go. Clerk, actually, Councillor Myers had a nice idea. She suggested that we should fly yours in the fourth, and you should fly ours in the first. And I, oh, I don't see any reason why we, we do wouldn't that. do that. So, City Manager, Mr. Clerk, our next uh, item is uh, part of the procedural uh, need for the uh, City Commission, a public comment section, and, and ask Mayor Bospis to. Okay. Listen. Is there anyone that would like to uh, make a comment at this time? Hearing none? So uh, even though we don't normally do this, we'll certainly extend the courtesy to our city councillors. Are there any city councillors that would like to uh, make any further comments? Councillor Turco, go ahead, please. Thank you. I think it's appropriate uh, for us to be here today that this is June the 6th. It was back uh, two great countries, a great province, and a great state, and two great cities. It was June the 6th, 1944, a little before my time, Bill. Uh, an event called D-Day. Mm -hmm. So here we are sitting together tonight. General Dwight Eisenhower gave the go-ahead to Operation Overlord. Some 156,000 forces, Americans, Canadians, and British landing on the beaches of Normandy. So today we thank the men and women who gave so much for us to be here tonight doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you.
Any other councillors? So before, before we wrap up, I just want to uh, recognize and thank the staff who did a lot of work uh, putting this meeting together and uh, thank our delegations for making the effort of putting together your presentations and come. We have quite a special relationship, our two cities. I think it's very unique. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find another Canadian city and another American city uh, that are not simply as close in geography, but are as in close in, in kinship and friendship and, and the effort we make to work together. And uh, uh, the border, it, it, it exists, but to a lot of our residents, it's just a time delay. It's something we have to stop at, answer a few questions at, and proceed through. I was uh, a customs officer at one point in my life, so I, I asked a lot of those questions, and uh, I was always impressed with the familiarity that, that we shared. And I think that uh, this has been a great experience and a great meeting, and I hope that we, we certainly do it again. I want to thank you, Mayor, uh, for keeping on us to do this meeting and, and leading as you did and making sure that we got together. And I want to thank you, Commissioners, for making the effort to come over here. And we look forward to uh, working with you. Uh, we've got a year and a half roughly left in our term, and uh, we certainly look forward to for doing this again. So thank you very much. Thank, well, thank you very much. And uh, um, this is just a great venue. Uh, we have certainly our, our city council and our building now, which is it's a great building, but uh, this, this venue works so well for, for the for these kind of meetings when you think about um, where else does this happen anywhere in the United States or in Canada um, or maybe in Europe um, this this is totally unique that both council and commission would meet and this is the fourth time um, it would be great to bring it to the next level where we would actually have a project or a, and hopefully that's not too far away um, uh, but again, uh, you know, thank you for your hospitality. It's um, certainly appreciated by our commission. And uh, again, uh, this this doesn't happen anywhere else in the in, in, in that I that I know of. And uh, we can continue to do this. Uh, and it doesn't have to be every other year. I think it started in 2003, um, and this is the fourth one. So that as time allows and as uh, Persistence allows. Uh, we, we continue to do this, and it's 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 just great. Thank you very much again for your hospitality. Thank you, Mr. Clark. I have a motion by Councillors Bruni and Christian, resolved that the Committee of the Whole now rise without reporting on the matter referred to it by City Council Twin Sue's Joint Council Commission meeting. All in favor? Carried. And a motion by Councillors Fata and Butlin, resolved that the Twin Sue's Joint Council Commission meetings shall now adjourn. All in favor? Carried. <laughs>